Um, so, sorry. All right. Um, so, what I'm talking about today is um, uh, what my, how my academic career and my research and, and my secular humanism have interacted. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my specialty is medieval European uh, history, uh, commonly known, the Middle Ages commonly known as the age of faith. So, um, you know, what's a secular humanist doing this? How has it affected me? And just to say a little bit about the back, my background before I became a medievalist, uh, I was raised in a Christian background, um, fairly liberal Christian background, and, and actually um, uh, overall a pretty good experience. Um, in my early 20s, I became an atheist, uh, really over the question of, uh, the fairly fundamental question of, how can you have an omnipotent deity and um, evil in the world, and how, if this omnipotent uh, deity is all good. Uh, so, you know, pretty simple logical question to which a lot of people have given answers over the years, uh, none of which satisfied me. But as I continued in my, and I was already on my way to becoming a medievalist at that point, but, um, as I continue in, my, in medieval studies, there are certain aspects of my field or, or the field the period I was studying that really reinforced that, but other aspects I think complicated it. And I, I sometimes feel like atheists can have uh, an overly simplified uh, picture of religion, including in the medieval world. So I'm going to sort of go two things. One, I'm going to confirm all your prejudices by talking about religious intolerance. Um, and then I'm going to um, flip the switch a little bit because the Middle Ages is often talked about as the age of faith. The idea is that one of the reasons for this is Christianity, and that's actually a little bit, uh, a lot more problematic. So we'll start with good old religious intolerance. Um, starting with the Crusades, you've all heard about them, the Inquisition and heresy, you've heard about that, uh, and the treatment of religious minorities within Christian Western Europe. Um, uh, pagans in newly conquered areas in some areas, um, mainly Jews and Muslims. And I'll start with a quotation uh, from the conquest of Jerusalem in the First Crusade, uh, talking about a slaughter uh, at the Dome of the Rock, uh, site of the former Temple of Solomon and, and the Second Temple. All right, so we killed them all. It was great. Um, and uh, this was one of the, uh, when the Crusaders conquered uh, Jerusalem, uh, they massacred the inhabitants and they conquered some other cities, they uh, massacred the inhabitants. Generally, they just made the local serfs, uh, whatever their religious background was. Uh, there were plenty of Christians there. Um, uh, and as you may know, on the way to Jerusalem, they slaughtered Jewish communities in Europe. So it was indeed quite bloody, uh, and no apologies for it. Um, you know, we slaughtered them and God was happy. Uh, this is the site uh, that this particular massacre took place, um, and uh, obviously uh, in Islam and, of course, Judaism. Uh, and this is a, a, a later depiction, a late medieval depiction of an, another massacre on the First Crusade. Um, and uh, again, pretty matter of fact. Uh, so um, no apologies. So Crusades were very much a thing. Uh, and they were indeed very bloody. Um, and of course, uh, you've all heard of jihad. As you probably know, jihad is actually a kind of complicated phenomenon. Uh, 
Uh, it comes from the Arab word for striving, and it can mean a variety of things, trying to peaceably convert people, trying to be a good Muslim. Uh, but uh, one very important meaning uh, throughout history has been religious warfare. Um, at the time of the Crusades, actually, um, jihad as warfare was a little bit in remission. Um, uh, with some exceptions, uh, you had a large Muslim empire that weren't really pushing forward. Um, the Muslim conquest, the Arab conquest had been some centuries uh, earlier. Uh, and in some ways, the Crusades revived jihad uh, as warfare in the Middle East in reaction to it. Uh, but in any case, both traditions, uh, both religions had uh, a tradition of religious warfare, newer at this point in Christianity, older in Islam. You also, of course, had uh, Inquisition. Uh, the Inquisition was directed towards heretics, and heretics are uh, quite specifically refers to Christians with the wrong Christian teachings, right? So Jews and Muslims are not heretics. They're unbelievers. They're non-Christians. Heretics um, are the Christians who are kind of on the losing side of the war of ideas. They think they're Christian. Um, they think the other Christians are heretics, um, but uh, the heretics are the, the, the uh, Christians with the wrong ideas and not enough power to back them up. Um, and uh, the Inquisition is originally just sort of a, a, a judicial method where you go in you don't sort of wait for people to accuse their neighbors of being heretics. You go in and search out heretics, um, and there's all kinds of um, rules and regulations, but it includes the use of torture, um, which was accepted because that had been accepted in Roman law. Um, uh, and uh, uh, if uh, people confessed and repented, then they can, uh, you know, they had to suffer some penalties, but they'd be okay, but if they recanted, they would be burned. Um, and uh, so over the Middle Ages, there were some uh, hundreds or thousands of burnings. Uh, later, the witchcraft scare got involved in this. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, Christians also used uh, crusading warfare against other Christians. So a group in southern France, the uh, Albigensians, had the wrong Christian I ideas. Uh, northern French, who had the right Christian I ideas, went down and conquered their area. Uh, the First Crusade had been called originally to help the Byzantine Empire, which actually was under attack by Muslims at that point, um, uh, by a newly converted group of Muslims, whether for religious warfare or because the Byzantine Empire was rich. Uh, is, is not clear. Um, the Byzantines weren't really expecting a crusade. Uh, the crusaders sort of went off and conquered Jerusalem on themselves. The reason I bring that up here is that the Western Christians and the Eastern Christians had somewhat different ideas, and the Fourth Crusade ended up actually going up against the Eastern Christians. Um, and so, you know, the First Crusade was to protect the Eastern Christians, the Fourth Crusade was to conquer them and make the, them the right kind of Christians. Uh, so religious intolerance sort of turned inward um, and turned into Europe. But of course, the people who suffered most from this in Europe uh, were, um, were religious minorities, were non-Christians. Um, so some of the Crusades, the Baltic Crusades, went up into what's now Lithuania and Latvia, uh, which were then pagan those folks were conquered and forcibly converted. Jews were allowed to live within Christian lands, uh, the theory being uh, that it was okay for them to be around as long as they were miserable uh, to show that uh, God's, you know, they had been God's chosen people before Jesus came along, but now they were no longer God's chosen people, and to show that they had to live in misery. Um, so they kind of had protection, um, but it was very limited, um, and so, you know, crusaders deciding that, uh, you know, why go off and kill Muslims when we can kill Jews right here and plunder them um, was pretty easy. Um, there were lots of crazy ideas about Jews murdering Christian boys, 
uh, desecrating Christian rituals, uh, which often led to trials in which Jews were, um, are, were killed or, or more commonly actually mob scenes. Uh, there were also Muslims in, in certain areas that had been reconquered by the Christians in, uh, in, in Spain and Portugal and in Sicily. Um, these uh, had sort of local protections, but no theological protections. Um, Muslims lived under uh, Christian rule for some generations in, um, in Sicily. Uh, they were eventually, they rebelled and were rounded up and moved to Italy. Uh, and then a couple of generations later, they were all sold into slavery. Uh, in uh, Iberia, uh, Muslims lived under Christian rule for some centuries, eventually forced to convert, and then a couple of generations. And this was in the aftermath of the, of the conquest of Granada in, uh, in 1492, uh, when Jews were also forced to convert or leave. Um, so lots of Jews and lots of Muslims were expelled. Later, the uh, Muslims that had converted to Christianity were expelled as well. There was a real mistrust of these new converts. Um, and so, you know, obviously, tremendous religious intolerance everywhere. And this had a pretty big impact, uh, not just on, you know, the, the victims you'd expect, uh, the, most of the minorities in the West, uh, the people who are attacked by Crusades, but as I said, it, you know, sort of came back in on Europe. Uh, and so when Luther started the Protestant Reformation, Catholics knew how to deal with this. These were heretics. Uh, if there were few enough of them in places like Spain and Italy, you brought them up in the Inquisition. Uh, if there were too many of them, you declared a crusade. Um, and so things like the Spanish Armada were technically a crusade. Um, others were led by national governments, uh, but Europe basically saw a century and a half of religious war among Christians and all these wars and indeed the Crusades, there were lots of motives and so forth. They weren't simply religious wars. Uh, but uh, Christianity's, <laughs> Christianity's intolerance sort of uh, uh, blew back on Christians in Europe in the early modern period. Another aspect of this uh, was uh, the justification of slavery. Uh, now, the big reason for the rise of the Atlantic slave trade was, of course, economic. Um, but how did you justify it? Well, in the Middle Ages, um, both Muslims and Christians, and um, well, they were the ones that mattered, <laughs> um, believed that um, you, you shouldn't enslave people of your own religion, but enslaving pagans or if you're Christians, enslaving Muslims, or if you're Muslims, enslaving Christians was just fine. So there was a lot of slave raiding going back and forth across the Mediterranean in the 14th and 15th centuries, also slave raiding into pagan Slavic lands. And so you're not dealing with a large scale plantation slavery um, uh, as you'd had, uh, or, or large scale slavery period as you'd had in the Roman period, or of course later in the New World. But once you had explorers going out into, the, uh, into these areas, you knew what to do with these people, you enslaved them. Um, so, um, it, it was a pretty easy transition ideologically um, from small scale trade, slave trading to large scale enslavement of uh, uh, Muslim and mainly pagan African people because uh, Muslim Africans tend to be better organized. Um, I'm just going to admit somebody. Um, all right, so. Um, limits to intolerance, I, because I'm, I'm going a little long, I'll, I'll sort of skip part of this. Yeah, not complete intolerance, um, but uh, really overwhelming intolerance, uh, not just in the Middle Ages, but um, into the early modern period. Really not until the Enlightenment that there's a small scale, uh, sorry, a large scale attempt to really grapple with this. Um, and um, in a sense, the Enlightenment view of religious intolerance, uh, of, of 
uh, enlightened urging of religious toleration came out of the long history of religious intolerance within Europe, um, uh, Christians fighting each other. I think the bigger thing is, of course, um, in the period I'm talking about, in the Middle Ages and early modern period, Christianity is very much a militant religion. Um, in the you know in the earliest centuries, it had been in some ways uh, kind of intolerant in the sense that thinking that everybody who wasn't Christian was going to go to hell. But you know, <laughs> Christians had no armies; they were they were being persecuted themselves. Um, and and there was a strong strain, strain of Christian pacifism. Um, more important is that uh, you know with the Enlightenment, Christianity moves away. Uh, to a large, in, in, in comparison with the Middle Ages, in a very large way from religious intolerance. Uh, obviously, there is still religious intolerance. I don't want to sugarcoat Christianity today. Point is just that it can it, it can vary, um, and um, and this is one reason why you know I think you know people who think that uh, Islam is going to be forever intolerant that can change too, and indeed. Recent, you know, recent Muslim militants, of course, the militants can point out back to earlier history. Um, but the revival, in, in some ways, this revival of militant jihad is a phenomenon of this gen, you know, generation or two. And earlier generations, for a few generations, not really seen that. So attitudes can shift whatever the religious texts say. Okay, so what about religion as the enemies of learning, uh, of science and all that? Here I'm going to go against sort of uh, some of the stereotypes, uh, having just reinforced some of the stereotypes. Start with the, the, the uh, Catholic West. Um, as I said earlier, Middle Ages is not only known as the age of faith, but the, the Dark Ages sometimes, and those are two are often seen as linked. Going back to some degree to Gibbon's idea, uh, work on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, there's this idea that Christianity destroyed Roman learning. Um, it's, that's really an oversimplification, and, and this is going to be a little bit of an oversimplification, but the, the, the big points are, in the West, what really hurt uh, classical Roman learning is the political and economic collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Just couldn't go on supporting Roman culture at the same level, the much poorer economy. But did survive, tended to go therefore through a Christian filter. Not so much Christians going out and trying to destroy pagan culture, but they were the ones with the resources, they preserved what they wanted. So large scale temples either fell down or got converted into churches. Um, and other large-scale buildings did. Um, religious texts tended to get preserved, so there's lots of late Roman Christian poets who you've never heard of because they're frankly pretty boring. Um, there's a lot of those, <laughs> um, and maybe, you know, whereas some of the, the classical poets that we'd like to have more of have been lost. But the Christians actually preserved a lot of pagan texts, Aeneid, um, uh, and here the, we're talking about the, the Latin ones in the West. Um, because Christianity was a religion centered around the book, they thought an educated Christian should know how to write uh, and how to read well. And how do you do that? You read the classics, you read Virgil, you read Ovid. And so they actually kept those within Christian church and said, okay, you know, pay don't pay attention to the pagan parts and, and the sex and all that. Um, just use this to learn how to be a good thinker and, and writer. But well over 90% of the Latin classical pagan texts we have that survived, survived because they were copied in the early Middle Ages and the Central Middle Ages. Because they were written in the Roman Empire in part uh, on, excuse me, on papyrus, which tends to disintegrate. They're copied in the Middle Ages on parchment because the trade with Egypt breaks down. So you have to write them on animal skin and that's much more durable. So the vast majority of Roman classical pagan writing that we have is preserved in, uh, by Christians. Um, and it's Christian churchmen and, and, and churchwomen nuns who uh, 
who have observed a lot of this. So just to give you an idea, these are the baths of Diocletian, um, this great sort of secular uh, Roman monument, but two thirds of it the ruin and um, one third is turned into a church and then later sort of decorated stuff. This is a, uh, I think, ninth century copy on parchment, on animal skin, of the Roman pagan comic poet Plautus, um, with lots of Roman art surviving. Uh, this is a medieval copy of uh, the work of Vitruvius. And so when Renaissance writers wanted to learn how to do Roman architecture, they were looking at medieval manuscripts of works. Greek learning. Uh, the Eastern Roman Empire survived um, as the Byzantine Empire, and the Byzantine Empire wasn't completely destroyed until 1453, so a thousand years after the Western Roman Empire. And Greek literature tended to survive for the same reasons that, that Roman Latin literature did, because if you wanted to be a good, uh, you know, Christian writer to understand the Greek New Testament, well, probably you wanted to also read Homer. Um, and so, uh, and eventually when the Byzantine Empire fell, some of those scholars went to Italy and, you know, brought their, their manuscripts and so forth. What's also interesting, though, is that um, some aspects of Greek learning went into the Muslim world. So the Muslims captured most of the Eastern Roman Empire with the initial great expansion, Egypt, Syria, the Holy Land. Um, much of which was dominated by Greek Hellenistic culture. Uh, and they weren't interested in Homer. Uh, interesting is sort of more Persian literature that dominates in the Muslim world. Um, but they were very interested in philosophy, um, which their definition included sort of what we would call science, so astronomy, astrology, uh, medicine, as well as uh, particularly Aristotle. Now, Works of Aristotle and Plato didn't survive in the West for the most part because they were written in Greek, uh, but they did survive in Greek and they were translated into Arabic. And then there was a tremendous amount of Arabic commentary on them uh, in the 11th, uh, 10th, 11th, 12th century. And Muslim world is gathering information from elsewhere. So Hindu numbers come to the Muslim world uh, and, and hence we know them as Arabic numerals. Just to give you a, some visual sense of that, uh, one late Roman Byzantine work on the natural world, which has all kinds of great illustrations of birds and plants and animals. On the left, you see an uh, illustration from the Byzantine uh, manuscript of the Greek. On the right, you see an Arabic translation with the same kinds of drawings. Or a treatise on the eye, um, an Arabic treatise based on Greek uh, medical knowledge, but with advances on it. Or an Arabic uh, uh, proof of the theorem. Um, so you can see the, <laughs> the diagram there surrounded by Arabic learning. And why that's kind of interesting is that much of this Arabic learning comes to uh, the Western, Western Europe via the Muslim world. Uh, also, lots of other cultures, so this is just a sideline. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of Muslim influence in medieval Europe. And one thing you can see locally is Muslim craftsmen worked in uh, Spain and Portugal for Christian nobles, uh, making textiles and things like this. So down at Biscay, you have an admiral rug, um, uh, which is one of, I think, like five in the world. Uh, it's a really remarkable survival of, uh, of the sort of uh, uh, Christian interact, cultural interaction in the middle of lots of, uh, of uh, religious intolerance on both sides, so probably more on the Christian side. Um, so there's this tremendous amount of cultural interaction, including with learning. So you see here Christians, uh, uh, astronomers uh, using uh, uh, astrolabe, which they picked up from the Arabs, a kind of astronomical instrument, and writing uh, in Arabic numerals. 
So far from crushing uh, Greek and Roman learning, both Christians and Muslims preserved it. Um, going back to the West, the early Middle Ages, when there wasn't much learning going on at all, most of it was preserved in monasteries and nunneries. In the 10th, 11th, or sorry, 11th, 12th, 13th century, the major intellectual revival in, uh, in Western Europe, and a lot of that is fueled by Greek and Arabic learning. Um, and so an example of this is scholastic theology. Um, uh, you may remember a few years back when George W. Bush was asked who the greatest philosopher was, he says, Jesus. Well, when, if you'd asked Thomas Aquinas, the, the great medieval theologian, he would have said Aristotle. And if you read Aristotle, uh, I mean, sorry, if you read Aquinas, anytime you see a reference to the philosopher, that's the pagan Aristotle. If you see a reference to the uh, commentator, that's Ibn Rushd of Eroes in, in Western Europe, who was one of the great uh, Muslim philosophers who commented on it. Uh, scholastic theology was all about merging reason and philosophy. Certain things they said you had to be taken on faith. They felt that they could prove most of that, including they felt they had multiple proofs of God's existence. Um, which modern philosophers tend not to accept as, as genuine proofs, um, but they, for their perspective, reason proved God's existence. Other things like the Trinity, like how is God one thing but three things, that maybe you have to take on faith. But they tried to limit that. They were also very interested in the study of the natural world. So yes, I mean, you can't have the scientific revolution, or at least it's fair to say the scientific revolution is intertwined with uh, they feed off of each other. But in many ways, uh, the, the modern science, modern European science at least, comes out of the ancient world, but via uh, Christian and Muslim agents. Um, and universities, I work at the universities, those are also uh, a medieval uh, Western Christian invention, uh, some have argued with influence from Islamic madrasas. Uh, it's a little harder to, to make that exact connection, um, but it's possible. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's it uh, for my talk. Uh, let's, oh, um, yeah, I just wanna say, you know, uh, we could take this in any sort of direction. Um, I just wanted to, Sort of throw this up is sort of talking about the complexities of religion and science and and uh, our religions uh, uh, inimical to everything we hold dear. So I will stop the sharing and uh, I guess we can uh, throw it open. I Glima, uh, I um, Glima had said that you know we, we're going to start with some general questions and maybe break out. I don't know if Lima wants to jump in here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just got a, te a text from her, uh, so she's texting, but I'm not sure she's connected with this okay. right now. Well, in any case, uh, if we're she can't little, hear We're me, a little sm small for uh, breaking out. Breakout so, sessions. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, why, I mean, she may have had some questions, she may have had some, but I'm happy to answer questions, uh, uh, answer pushback, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, sort of maybe we can think together a little bit about this. Well, you looked at it like a historian, uh, which you are, uh, <laughs> so that, but that's, that's sort of all in the past. Uh, what do you think uh, going forward from here? with religion. Uh, yes, the Arabs uh, saved learning uh, for quite a while, but they're not uh, the great ed best educators uh, okay. nowadays. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I think that, that obviously there's real clashes between um, uh, religion and science in particular. Um, and uh, obviously we see that in our uh, own setting um, with things like uh, uh, evolution, climate science, and so forth, and the societies that are more deeply religious in a conservative way, um, yeah, that's going to be greater. 
Um, and I think that's true for, I mean, it's going to be true for a while in Islam. I think there's going to be a backlash uh, eventually. Um, uh, historians are particularly bad at predictions. So, <laughs> you know, take that for what you want. Um, but, I, you know, in some ways, militant Islam has come on saying we have all the answers and obviously they don't. And eventually you're going to get a little fed up with it. Um, one thing that I think is useful that the, you know, the religious leaders of the West had this idea of sort of separate spheres of science and, and religion and science could explain some things and religion um, could explain others. Um, and while, you know, obviously I don't believe except the, <laughs> the religious end of things, it was kind of a useful thing in, in the West in terms of saying, you know, religious leaders could say, um, um, you know, we'll let science be science. Um, and, you know, there was for a, quite a while by sort of mainstream denominations in the West, um, an accommodation with uh, science. And that's something I, you know, I, I, I hope religious leaders everywhere will try to do, um, we'll see. Um, there's a question being read and, and I see Anjan has your hand up. I'll read the question first. Um, given pagans, philosophers, scientists, etc., all continue to uh, perform studies of life and nature, did you have an opportunity to connect how ruling classes pick specific explanations for the unknown to allow them to better rule? Um, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> um, that's kind of a more general question and Anjan and others could probably answer that as well as I do. But certainly there's an element of power in all this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, power is something that we're seeing in all kinds of ways now. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, for the religious right to maintain power, um, you know, or for polluters to maintain power, uh, attacks on science are very useful. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of that is fueling things. I'm um, John, but, but other people can, you know, jump in on that too. Thanks so much, Hugh. Uh, my question is actually not unrelated to uh, the previous one. Um, I wanted to ask you as a historian, uh, historians are uh, famous for being able to appreciate the, the vast complexity of the multiple uh, uh, factors that go into determining how any particular sweep of history may evolve. And I'm, I'm curious, this is an embarrassing question because we're colleagues and I should know this already, but I don't. Um, in your own work, I mean, take for example, the, the early part of your talk when you're talking about religious intolerance and, and, and persecution. You kind of hinted at what I wanted to ask about when you said, you know, of course there were many motivations for uh, the events that you discussed. And so, you know, we can certainly frame this very convincingly, compellingly, in terms of uh, clashes of religion. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of da uh, dogs wagging tails and tails wagging dogs. There are socioeconomic um, uh, issues that are driving some of this. There are, uh, you know, political uh, and power issues driving some of this. And I'm curious in your own work whether you think it's possible to sort of extricate these different factors from one another when thinking about things like, you know, the Crusades or the Inquisition or, you know, so, so that you can actually make claims like, and now I'm going to caricature, but, you know, some of the new atheists do this, like religion causes war, you know, I mean, that, now that's a caricature because it's so flat-footed, but do you think it's it's possible to extricate these you know these many different factors that go into determining how the Crusades developed, how the Inquisition developed, and you know apportion uh, blame or credit to you know the thirst for power or the desire to persecute religious rivals, or or is it just an inextricable mess? Mm -hmm. So I um, I think you have to do it through inference because generally what they say is I'm doing it because I'm a good Christian. Um, right, this is a period of intolerance is, is the right. <laughs> you know, the good people are the intolerant people. So I'm going off and finding it. So you have to infer it. 
Um, so in a place like Iberia, where Christians and Muslims have been fighting for a while, sometimes Christians ally with Muslims against other Christians and so forth, uh, and then suddenly they're saying they're doing it for religion. Um, yeah, I mean, I think motives are mixed, but, um, you know, there it's easier to see the economic motives. Uh, the Italians, Italian uh, city-states like Venice and Genoa are in a sense fighting uh, before the Crusades for market share <laughs> through, uh, through warfare in the Mediterranean. So you can see, you know, economic things for them. On the other hand, for the first crusade, which is the most successful in terms of conquering territory, a lot of the leaders immediately turn around and go home. Um, and crusading is enormously expensive um, later on. And uh, you see for generations, leaders spending huge amounts of money um, going off and dying in large numbers uh, and then coming back. Um, and, um, you know, the, they're getting some plunder if they're lucky, um, but economically it's a, it's, it's, it's a bad proposition. Um, what are they getting? Um, prestige uh, and so forth, but it's, you know, clearly for them, this genuine religious fanaticism is a big part of it. But you do really have to infer it, and you also have to accept that. I mean, I think, you know, Venetians were looking for market share, but they were also genuinely, <laughs> genuinely religiously intolerant. Galia, I think you had a question. Oh, you need to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. I appreciate the talk. Um, and actually, I was, uh, I wanted to ask a question not dissimilar to the one Anjan just asked. I once heard somebody talk about how um, the Muslims started um, not, not uh, having scientific discourse and progressing sometime uh, when one of their uh, guys decided that mathematics and anything to do with that was uh, verboten and, mm -hmm. uh, and that plunged them into their own dark ages. Um, and I'm wondering how, how parallel is that to the Christian dark ages? Is that, is that? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm actually going to draw a, a, a parallel that's sort of a little later in the Middle Ages. When people now talk about the Dark Ages, they're usually talking about the earlier period. But I think what's kind of more interesting is in the 12th and 13th century, debates are going on like this um, in Christianity, uh, Islam, and Judaism. So you think of somebody like Moses Maimonides. Um, and they're all sort of talking to each other. Uh, or at least reading each other's works. Um, uh, interestingly, a lot of the, um, <laughs> there, there's a lot of uh, uh, Jewish Arabists, and sometimes when Christians are getting works translated from Arabic, they're relying on Jewish translators who also speak uh, some variant of Spanish. That's kind of a digression. But this is going on all the same time, and there's fights in all three religions. So at one point, the, the Bishop of Paris says, you can't teach Aristotle to undergraduates at, at the University of Paris because pagan. Um, and yeah, it, it looks like it, somehow Christianity is able to uh, kind of fin somehow it gets wrapped into Christianity a little bit more by people like Aquinas or his teacher, Albertus Magnus, who are interested in the natural world. Now, then you get, of course, Galileo. Um, and I mean, this adds an interesting twist to it because what Galileo is arguing against is the Ptolemaic universe, um, which is a pagan construct. Um, that then sort of gets incorporated and into Christianity by people like Aquinas. Um, and <laughs> so, you know, it's just this really complex thing. Um, and 
why that doesn't happen in Islam is, is not so clear. Um, and, and also because my, you know, I'd have to say my specialty is, um, it is in Christian Western Europe. Um, but it seems like the, the fights go on in Islam. Um, one thing is that Islam has no central authority. Um, so there's nobody to sort of say, ah, it's okay to, to include science or to say it's not. Um, and it just doesn't seem to catch on the way that it does in the West, although it's never systematically wiped out there either. Um, so, um, you know, you, you, you still have people in the 18th, 19th century um, in the Islamic world interested in astronomy and things like that. Um, so another factor may be the enlightenment and the scientific revolution. And the question may be why they happened in the West as opposed to why they didn't happen in Islam. But historians really, <laughs> we, we've been asking that question for a long time. And I'm not sure we have a fantastic idea of why, why the, the Islamic world and why the Christian world went in a different direction. And, and I mean, there's a, a similar question that doesn't involve religion so much with why China didn't take off in terms of the science. So these, these are big questions. And I guess going back to Anjan's point, religion is only one aspect. That's kind of a long-winded answer way of saying I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, excuse, forgive me, but I have uh, another question. Uh -huh. um, why would, uh, how does the idea of economic advantage to the, the, this kind of religious dominance, uh, how would it mesh with the waste of human potential in keeping women down? Mm -hmm. So, I, th I mean, I think um, one of the things is the traditional religions, I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which traditional religions have been ambivalent about economic growth. Uh, so you also think about bans on lending and interest. Um, and, um, uh, and concern about commerce. So treatment of women is, is one of those, uh, is a bigger part of it. And you know, all, all of these religions, like all these pre-modern societies are pretty patriarchal. Um, so it's just, you know, of course we're going to, you know, have, have male dominance over women. Uh, and you know, what does that have to do with the economy? Um, I think it's a, that becomes a bigger question in the modern world when people start thinking, oh, we can have economic growth, um, that uh, it's not just going to, you know, and there was economic growth, obviously, in the, in the Muslim world and in the medieval world that's very slow. And, you know, you have a war, you have a famine, it goes backwards. Once you start thinking about economic growth, then you can start having those trade-offs. And interestingly, when people argue for toleration, um, and this doesn't answer your question about woman, but you see some of the early Western European people arguing for toleration, they point to places like the Netherlands where, okay, you can have Jews coming in, having a useful economic role. Um, if you have toleration, you can, all over the world. Um, and um, then that opens up arguments for the ones like you're making. Um, I think part of the thing for, of course, militant Muslims today um, is, well, you know, it, <laughs> the way to make everybody happy is, is uh, uh, you know, bringing back Islamic law. Um, that's the answer to everything. <laughs> so women will be happy too. Um, but of course, it's also all these religions are very conservative. Um, so for a similar reason, you know, patriarchal Christians, conservative Christians will, 
appeal to religion to because the you know women are challenging our position so it all gets sort of wrapped up um, again that's kind of long-winded but does that sort of get at your answer so, uh, sorry you're, you, you need to unmute again oh, sorry I said, <laughs> I said yes a little bit but i'm still looking for you know um, I, i'm still looking to understand the advantage of um, repressing half of human potential that you have in any given society. It's, it's, it's a mystery to me a little bit. It's, um, and especially in societies that um, once they, since we see that once a society opens up, it opens up to the idea that women can mm -hmm. contribute. And so, so that's... I think it comes back to the yeah. earlier question about religion and power. Uh, so if you're on the dominant half, of, you know, if you're on the male side of that equation, you know, um, uh, then you can kind of say, well, you know, how nice for me um, that God says that I should have the upper hand. Um, and so, you know, of course, ultimately the counter argument is precisely what you said, that we all are better off. Um, if, um, uh, if there's equality, um, that it really benefits everybody. But if you're invested in that older system, religion is great. Um, because, you know, and, and similarly, uh, going back to the other question, which I think came from, uh, Gleema, um, you know, she, she asked about the Veda, Vedas and the caste system. So religion can often be used, again, as complex as, as Anjan was pointing out, there's all kinds of things, but religion and power, they're very closely intertwined. Um, and so you think of medieval Christianity, this religion that, uh, you know, they're, they're calling on a religion that supposedly valorizes poverty, uh, saying, okay, <laughs> poverty is great, but the social system is ordained by God. Um, so the people who have power often use religion to, to reinforce that. Um, uh, uh, without necessarily being completely cynical about it. Um, it's kind of, uh, you know, one nice thing about, you know, being religious, if it reinforces what you want to believe anyway, then you can be generally religious and, uh, and, and use it. Uh, Jack, uh, you have a question? Yes, thank you. That was a really, really interesting talk and answers. Um, there's this historian I really like named Richard Bullitt, and uh, he made the point in one of his talks that uh, Islamic law was a big part of what made um, the Islamic world, in particular the Ottoman Empire, relatively stable during the uh, kind of the, the late Renaissance of the pre-modern period, or the kind of early, or not pre an early modern period. And so I was wondering what your thoughts were on Islamic law and its role in those, uh, in those areas in keeping things stable or unstable. Yeah, so I mean, um, um, you know, it's all comparative, right? None of us would want to live in the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> None of us. <laughs> um, but, um, it was a stable empire by the standards of the time. And if you were Jewish, uh, it was better to be in the Ottoman Empire um, because you had certain protections than to be in Western Europe. Um, uh, be, and a good illustration of that is, where did the Jews who were expelled from Spain go? A lot of them went to, uh, to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so that you had a, um, a speaking Jewish community in, in what's now Thessalonica, a city called uh, in Greece, but was then called Salonica. You had a, a Ladino speaking Jewish population that was a big percentage of the city up until the Holocaust. Um, and by that time, of course, it was part of Greece and the, the Enlightenment and so forth. Um, so if you had, you know, um, if you were a protected second-class citizen as a Jew or Muslim, 
uh, sorry, as a Jew or, or, or a Christian in, in the Ottoman Empire. It's better than being a, a you know, a thoroughly persecuted uh, one with no protection. So you're sort of, uh, you're, you know, you're, you're below Muslims, but there's a certain stability there. Um, and actually, apparently, some peasants kind of like the Ottoman Empire because there were lower taxes, um, uh, at least initially. Uh, so some of these Muslim empires were very sophisticated, very stable. Um, people talk about a, an Islamic green revolution. Um, so uh, crops like uh, uh, citrus crops, rice, um, uh, sugar, all come from the Muslim world to Western Europe and then spread from there. Um, you were asking specifically about Muslim law. Uh, yeah. I hear your question so well. Uh, gotcha. Should I? Can you hear me now? It's cutting in and out a little bit. Is this better? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I have my audio, my audio interface here. I think I forgot to change the input. Um, yeah, I mean, you totally answered my question. I guess the one other part that that interested in me about what he says, how he felt that um, the secular dictatorships that took power in the mid-century kind of uh, dismantled Islamic institutions, um, which which helped them and and might might seem like beneficial in a secular uh, conception, but but was not actually beneficial to the to the people to the Muslims living under their rule. So I was wondering if you could comment on that situation because. I only know kind of the vague narrative of all Yeah, I mean, and, and this is, a lot of this is after my period and outside my area of expertise. So I want you to take my answer with a great grain of salt. Um, some of those, uh, I mean, there are a lot of Muslim charitable institutions um, that uh, existed under Islam and for poor Muslims did, um, uh, were useful um, and um, could have easily been, I think, replaced and, and improved upon by functional states. <laughs> um, but with the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, um, you sort of got these colonial powers and you got a lot of strife and so forth. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, and breaking up those institutions was also a source of instability. Um, so, you know, one of the things that the um, um, the uh, led to say the Iranian Revolution was the uh, distribution of land, redistribution of land, the breakup of some of these institutions. Um, I think the secular state could have, re, re, you know, done much better job in the long term, um, but in the short term, you had kleptocratic dictatorships or colonial powers, or um, you know, breaking up the old without replacing them. Um, so yeah, I think I mean, in any of these post-colonial situations, you have a or colonial situations, you have a lot of of um, uh, dislocation, which makes it harder to create the kinds of, I mean, it's hard enough to create these kinds of modern states in the West. <laughs> and with all this disruption, it made it even harder. Um, you know, so in, in some ways, that's why the, the mullahs were able to come back in Iran uh, and say, you know, look, the old ways were better. We have all the answers. Um, but as I say, I also think, you know, well, already in Iran, there's backlash against that. It has been for a while. Um, what the future will lead there, I don't know. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. Other questions? Uh, let me just... Uh, somebody typed in control limited resources that benefit the top 10% of society. Yeah, I mean, um, 
church in the Middle Ages was very rich. Um, uh, and uh, so it was very intertwined with the power structures. Um, if you could claim that uh, as a king that God had appointed you <laughs> and, you know, there were religious rituals for kingship. Um, but even on a lower level, uh, so in medieval villages, um, we can sort of trace social structures within medieval villages. And it's, it's the sort of top layer of the village that um, kind of runs the parish institutions, the, the uh, fairs to run, to raise money for the church. Um, so, you know, even pretty far down society, people could be invested in religion because it bolstered their power, right? These are, um, you know, the, the top level of the peasantry. I mean, the peasantry is maybe 70, 80% of the population. So they're, they're still, you know, um, they're still maybe the top 30%, or the top 40% if you're a peasant, uh, if you're an upper peasant, uh, you know, the, the nobles and, and so forth are way higher than them. But even for them, you know, uh, and if you're a man and, and the church tells you that your wife should obey you, that gives you a little bit of investment in religion. Um, and uh, so uh, it, it is sort of the top power structure, but it can go down to the power structures throughout society. Um, and, and um, you know, religion can challenge those, uh, but more often, once it gets stabilized, then it reinforces the power structures. And that's, uh, that's pretty simple. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions or, you know, uh, other people who want to ask questions. Um, uh, uh, Anjan, did you have another question? Or is your hand still up from the old one? Uh, you're muted. I did, I did have a, a question, but um, why don't I go after everybody else has asked questions? I think Duncan has one. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, mine uh, hooks spray uh, up with what you were just saying. Um, I read in the Atlantic or somewhere that uh, medieval society, in medieval society, the peasants actually had it better than they did in the uh, Renaissance uh, society because they uh, there was basically a consensus and there weren't... Uh, these large, devastating wars. Uh, I'd actually disagree with that. Um, later, Middle Age, later medieval peasants were probably a little better off um, than Renaissance peasants because the Black Death in the 1340s and afterwards had killed off uh, 40, 50, 60 percent of the population, and it put them in a better bargaining rate uh, because there was. Uh, less demand for land and more demand for labor. Um, so um, those peasants who survived the massive disruption of their pandemic, um, their lifestyles improved, um, uh, population remained low because of uh, repeated uh, visitations of the Black Death. Um, so the population dropped by about half um, in the mid 14th century and remained that way for more than a century. 16th century population started going back up. Um, Renaissance disrupted some things, but the late Middle Ages had plenty of wars. Um, Renaissance had plenty of wars. Um, I think it would be true in certain places. Um, uh, so for instance, the Thirty Years' War, which was one of these religious wars in Germany, really tore the countryside apart. Um, and uh, so peasants really got hit by that, but that was more that sort of specific religious war uh, than the Renaissance in general. Um, so uh, certainly the Renaissance didn't help peasants <laughs> very much. I mean, that was more sort of economic lift uh, with technological change later on. But I, I wouldn't say it hurt them. Um, okay, thank you. These are big things, and so other historians might disagree. And obviously, whoever you read in the Atlantic disagreed. I'm done. <laughs>
Thanks, Hugh. I, I wanted to ask you about um, something that might be related to some of the things you uh, told us about. You gave us a very nice snapshot of some of the dynamics of uh, inter-religious relations, mm -hmm. uh, persecution and intolerance uh, between people of faith. Mm -hmm. so, you know, heretics are bad, you know, unbelievers are even worse, right? There are all these like circles of people that you might want to persecute or otherwise, you know, uh, despise or uh, contest. Um, is it is it possible to really engage with the question of uh, uh, the absence of faith or atheism in this period? I mean, I often get asked about, you know, the history of atheism, and I find it very difficult to grapple with just because unlike uh, representations of various religions, when so long as you had a community, right, you could profess what you believe, you could write about it, you could theorize about it, you could philosophize about it, you could do all these things. Um, that was much less the case often for people who had an absence of faith. Um, are, you able, do you, are you able to uncover evidence that allows you to do historical scholarship of this in the same period? And what are the constraints there? It's challenging. Um, uh... Uh, and some people would say, you know, no, atheism was just inconceivable in the Middle Ages. Um, I think that's wrong. Um, because you do get people hauled up in, in before the Inquisition saying, nope, it's all just fucking and shitting. And that's one literal quote from, from one guy who's pulled up. Um, they're called materialists, right? There's nothing but the material world. Um, and there's claims that, you know, some of these Muslim philosophers like Averroes are really materialists. Um, there's not much evidence of it. But again, you know, if you, if you say that, you get, you're going to get hauled before the Inquisition. Um, so I think there's probably some. Um, but I think it is probably harder in the Middle Ages. Um, and you just think of kind of um, in, in the Enlightenment, really radical thinkers still have trouble moving beyond deism, right? <laughs> we can maybe question Jesus' uh, 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 divinity, but, you know, uh, and, and uh, so getting to outright atheism seems hard, even with people really willing to challenge uh, it. Um, and I think in a pre-modern society, uh, I'll get to you in just a sec, but in a pre-modern society, when you don't have explanations like evolution, the argument from design is, is stronger. Um, how do you explain this wonderful world with all these different animals and so forth? Uh, evolution gives us a tool to understand that. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, without that tool, it's sort of harder to push away from the idea of God. Um, although, obviously, there were atheists before, um, uh, before Darwin. Um, and, um, you know, some of the questions come up with, you know, the, the great Lisbon earthquake. How could God allow this, this huge thing? Um, um, so questions of... Uh, uh, of God and, and good and evil came up. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, there's a question. I, uh, uh, you're listed under Elizabeth Cueto. <laughs> yeah, this is Oscar. Um, uh, one of the common arguments I get from, from religious people is that all the progress and all the scientific knowledge we have now is because Christianity in particular, right? Um, preserve all this knowledge during the Middle Ages. And they were the ones that actually, you know, preserve and protect all this information that actually move on into the Renaissance and make all the scientific progress after that. Uh, I believe that is not true. And actually they were the responsible for holding the growth in knowledge that was coming from, from the previous era. But that is a very common argument that you hear from, from religious people is that actually religion was important to, you know, have this, the scientific knowledge that we have now. 
So do you believe that actually, you know, religious institutions were fundamental to maintain the knowledge or uh, they are, you know, they, they hold back uh, the progress of humanity? I think in, in that particular context, yes, Christian institutions did maintain it. But I think in the bigger context and, and to, you know, to sort of provide the easy answer to your, your, the people you're talking to, they're preserving pagan learning. So, you know, they're preserving Aristotle, they're preserving Plato. So how does Christianity get, uh, you know, how does that pr prove that Christianity, you know, you need Christianity to create knowledge? Um, in a, you know, in the certain, in the specific medieval context where there's just this, so much economic uh, dislocation, the Christians were the only around who, who could preserve it. But if the pagan Romans survived, uh, they would have preserved it. Um, you know, uh, you have various religions in China that were able to, you know, and, and uh, you kind of had uh, state preservations in China religion is not so central to, to maintaining it. So, so I think uh, moving from the specific to the general, that argument doesn't really work. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think you want to step between, you know, religion destroys knowledge, always and never forever, uh, and saying religion somehow creates <laughs> knowledge for it, always and, and forever. Yeah, I, usually they use examples like, you know, St. Thomas or um, Mendel that, you know, made important progress in philosophy and uh, science, in this case, in evolution, genetics, uh, as examples of how important religious people was to maintain. And basically said that everybody who was a scientist in the medieval ages or even in the early centuries, 16th, 17th centuries, were all Christians. Of course, you know, you have to keep it in context that there was no option. I mean, you will be Christian or you will be executed. <laughs> yeah. But they, I mean, it's, it's a common positive bias that religious people have is to point to, you know, some of the smart people in the past as Christians. And then that's why it's important to be religious because religion somehow inspired people to be better or something. Right. Um, well, I'm just, you know, want to know your, 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 opinion about it. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, similarly people point to cathedrals and, and music and, you know, that proves we have to have religion. And, and I love cathedrals and there's a lot of Christian, you know, Bach and so forth music that I love. But yeah, I, I mean, I think you're right that in a society where everybody's Christian, then, <laughs> you know, the scientists are going to be Christian, the musicians are going to be Christian. When the church is a, a, in a society where a religious institution is one of the major patrons, then a lot of it is going to be specifically religious. Um, but, you know, the, the counterpoint to that is, you know, Galileo gets shut up by the church. Um, so, um, and um, that, uh, you know, a lot of this learning comes from other religions. Um, and, you know, I don't see how pagan pagan learning can prove that Christianity is the right religion. So there's kind of a sliding between <laughs> the two. Religion is good, therefore my religion must be the true. Um, um, so I think, you know, there's, you can, you can acknowledge that uh, on some level. You can also point out that uh, in the modern world, scientists are more likely than the general population to be atheists. Uh, so how does that work? Um, you know, there are religious scientists today, but religion, you know. Uh, right. That's, uh, that's a good point. Um, you know, if you're going to say you have to have religion for science, no. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, there's, um, from your historical, I'm just reading this, from your historical point of view, Viewpoint. Can you make any suggestions how secular humanists can work towards counteracting fundamentalist religions, which seem to accompany authoritarian rule across the world today? Um, yeah, and this includes Christianity, Islam, Hinduism. And one thing is just to, in a sense, hold firm to our secularist ideas. 
I mean, just uh, to, to treat it as an ongoing struggle, uh, to stand up for what we believe in, um, to um, uh, do what we're doing. Um, and there's no simple answer. Um, uh, obviously, in our own context, voting <laughs> is, you know, uh, is, is something. Um, um, uh, um, and um, so, um, uh, and I think, you know, setting examples as, you know, we're decent humans and human beings and we're atheists. Um, it, with that thing, sort of trying to, uh, trying to figure out what you can do as an individual um, is, is tricky. Um, but, um, um, uh, I think, I think we all already have the tools, I guess, and I don't have any special tools. Um, I guess one ray of hope I would say is that given that we have these tools, um, I think it, you know, in a sense, when, when with the enlightenment as you're moving towards religious tolerance, that's really hard because you're sort of arguing for something new. But now, uh, you know, uh, I, I've mentioned this several times, I think there will be a backlash to Islamic fundamentalism uh, in, in the, certainly in the medium term, uh, certainly in the long term, I think in the medium term and, and maybe even in the short term, there's already models, right? When, for people who kind of think, oh God, you know, uh, 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 how, how are these, uh, you know, this world or this society ruled by imams or Republicans, uh, you know, Republican religious right people is awful. Well, we know what the alternative is. Um, and so, uh, you know, in a sense, I, I think it's just sort of maintaining our ideals and, and maintaining that hold, uh, you know, upholding them and organizing um, and teaching and, and learning. So no great idea, uh, no magic bullet, but uh, again, I think doing what we're doing. Uh, yeah, and, and Anjan has a very a good answer. Anjan, did you want to, well, people can read it on the chat, or I don't know, Anjan, if you want to elaborate on that. Sure, yeah. I mean, just in, in response to uh, your discussion with Oscar, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, really the idea, you know, if, if someone is saying to Oscar or anyone else that, you know, religion is required for science or religious insight is required for the development of scientific knowledge, it's, it's a slightly confused thing to say, I think, in part because, you know, the term science wasn't even really coined until the 19th century. Um, so, you know, looking back to earlier periods, we have different practices that were really amalgams of what we would now think of science, as well as theology, as well as, you know, there are various forms of inquiry that were kind of mixed together. Um, and so to say that, you know, one strand of this was required for another strand is just, it's not really understanding how, uh, you know, uh, the investigation of the natural world worked. It's just that these were different aspects of the world that people thought needed to be brought into a kind of systematic coherence with one another. And over time, you know, those threads separated themselves so that now we think of the sciences as something completely independent from theological inquiry and vice versa. Um, but it might not have been possible to think of them quite that way earlier. Yeah, I, I, I really second that. 
So I think uh, probably is, is a good time to wind down. Uh, I think people are <laughs> departing and, and so forth. If anybody has a, an urgent question, um, uh, fire away. Uh, if not, and, and if you have any questions, um, I'm at the University of Miami. You can look me up in the history department and or I'll, uh, my email is h.thomas at miami.edu. So I'm happy to, you know, if, if you do want to follow up with any of these things, uh, uh, please feel free to get in contact with me. Um, I'm not sure if Glima, I don't think Glima can 